hello everyone so this has been a great uh, series of lectures on cryo em and related techniques by experts on different disciplines and today uh, we have arrived on the last day of the lecture series and we have an amazing researcher uh, professor yi chui uh, who is originally from uh, china and uh, he has pursued his graduate study in physical chemistry at harvard university and obtained his phd in 2002 At Harvard, he pioneered nanoscale sensors and devices for highly sensitive detection based on the silicon nanowire technology. After that, he went to work as a Miller postdoctoral fellow at the University of California, Berkeley. At Berkeley, he worked on electronic property and assembly of colloidal nanostructures. In 2005, he joined the department Department of Material Science and Engineering at Stanford University as an assistant professor. and started to pursue energy and environment related research in 2016 kui took inspiration from structural biology and employed cryo em to image batteries at an atomic resolution for the first time the high resolution imaging unveiled the nature of lithium dendrite providing mechanistic insights into the nanostructure of solid electrolyte interface currently his group is implementing cryo em to probe atomic and molecular details in the metal organic framework perovskite and other nanomaterials he has published more than 500 journal articles which have attracted nearly 2 lakhs of citations and this outstanding contribution to uh, science has been recognized with numerous awards and honors like ecs battery technology award by electrochemical society Number one ranked material scientist worldwide by Thomas Reuters, distinguished award for novel materials and their synthesis by IUPAC, the Wilson Prize by Harvard University to name a few. His invention has been recognized as top ten world changing technologies by Scientific American. He is one of the associate editors of the journal Nano Letter since 2011. Besides. He is the he is in the advisory board of many prestigious journals of American Chemical Society, American Physical Society, Electrochemical Society, New York Academy of Sciences, American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, etc. So, with this brief introduction, let me welcome our today's speaker and uh, stop sharing my screen. Well, thank you so much for. Your invitation and uh, very nice introduction. Um, so it's uh, of course it's a challenging time during COVID nineteen. I appreciate uh, your invitation. Indeed, the COVID nineteen, we all learn how to use a virtual seminar. This is actually my first time to give a seminar uh, to university in India. uh i it's my great honor to do so my uh last time my first time visit was uh, right before covid when the covid just uh, uh broke out in february i was in uh, uh delhi um i have a really nice trip right there so uh but to university this is my first time i would like to thank uh, pradeep uh, for the very nice invitation uh talking about electron microscopy uh, for energy sciences in the, in the in the introduction you have been seeing you know, how i get into cryo em so let me share with you my excitement about electron microscopy for energy sciences um i myself work on energy materials a lot so during this process of uh, studying um, many energy materials um I find out while well, many materials are fragile, fragile, they are dynamic. For example, batteries. You have lithium ion in and out. You know these ionic movements right there. Atoms are moving. Uh, metal organic frameworks. These absorb gas. This open structure also dynamic. Electrocatalysts. You know gas molecule coming in and going out. And surface atoms might be changing this catalyst. Um, Perovskite solar cell is uh, well known; they are not that stable. 
uh, nano and organic interface, right there, this organic molecule in, a, uh, in the nanostructure. Uh, how do you obtain atomic scale resolution, maintain the intrinsic structure, it's uh, critical. And how do you look at the dynamic process and understand what's happening? So these uh, really present challenges and opportunities for us to think about it. Um, let me use the example. Uh, my group has been working on uh, the area of uh, batteries um, to illustrate and how we really design the tools is, uh, that provide the materials guiding principle for us to design the materials to solve the problem in energy storage. We know batteries are important for enabling electronics uh, drone electrical vehicles now moving into the stationary energy storage market, integrate solar and wind into the uh, uh, grid. Um, and the importance of lithium ion batteries, particularly, was recognized uh, uh, with a Nobel Prize in Cambridge in 2019. John Good and now Stan Whittingham, two of my friends, they won this prize at Yoshino you know, in Japan for the development of lithium-ion batteries. So after this, then we ask the questions, um, what's next? How do we move to the next level? Uh, what's the, what are the grand challenges we try to solve? So one is how high the energy density batteries can go. Measure in watt per kilogram or watt per liter, basically per unit weight or per unit volume. So we need to store a lot more energy. How do we do that? Um, how do we extend the battery life longer? Cycle life or calendar life? Can we have 30 years lifetime batteries for the lithium ion? We don't have that yet. We are basically having probably about 10 to 15 years. That's it. Uh, can we do fast charging? You know, you're pumping in electrons, lithium ion going in so fast, there's a lot of materials change. Can we do fast charging? You do it so fast, this huge structure change, volume expansion interface is, uh, you know, under the stress. Uh, can we understand that? Um, and next is, uh, can we make the batteries completely safe, right? You still see batteries catching fires. Can we reduce the cost? three times or more. And how do we know the battery inside health condition? And what's the, what are the strategies for battery reuse and recycling? And for the grid scale and seasonal storage, how do we do that? So these all present great challenges right there. And this is coupled back to the materials, material science, the structure transformation, the interface, and we need to understand uh, the atomic scale, what's happening. So for example, how do we increase the energy density per unit weight or volume? These are the different materials listing right here, plotting in a way vertical axis is their volume change in a relative sense percentage. Once lithium coming in and going out, what, how much volume change you will have in terms of percentage? Horizontal axis is the number of lithium ion to the host atomic ratio. For example, carbon right here, graphite using the existing lithium ion batteries is um, carbon, six carbon atoms store one lithium. So it's a one to six, the ratio. So current technology basically concentrate in about one to six or one to five, roughly around this range. The more lithium you store, the more energy you can potentially get. That means the more electrons you store, you see the volume expansion is going up. Lithium to host atom atomic ratio is increased until you hit to metallic lithium. You don't have a host atom anymore. It's a really the infinite, right? Number is infinite right there. But the relative volume expansion from empty state to field state is also infinite. It becomes harder and harder and harder. So what we learned from the past 30 years of lithium-ion batteries commercialization, 
compared to that, we what we want this new material that's not stable, the unstable host compared to the stable one. You know, this chemical bond breaking for the new materials on the right. Host atoms move to very long distance, complete structure change, a very large volume expansion that's 10 times or higher. And uh, this presents a new challenges for us to handle in the materials level. So our high capacity new generation of material design require a paradigm shift. And how do we, we design those? Um, if we could do that, we can go from current energy density about 250 watt per kilogram to 400 watt per kilogram to 500 or 600 or higher. So if we could do that. Um, so let me share with you the first example, very famous one. This is now reaching in the States, driving the whole industry's energy density. You know, company including Tesla is putting silicon into the end. No, but I started this, uh, this idea, uh, start to work on it when I joined Stanford faculty and uh, published the first paper more than 12 years ago. Um, here is a silicon anode, um, this particle, right? Lithium coming in, silicon store a lot more lithium compared to graphite carbon. This is 11 times capacity of graphite. But silicon's volume expansion is gigantic. Lithium coming in, silicon expand to four times, uh, by four times sometimes, and it can, it's going to break. This causes huge stress accumulation. How to avoid the breaking? And how do you build stable solid electrolyte interface, SEI? Right? Because silicon with lithium coming in reacts with organic electrolyte and uh, create this artificial layer, solid electrolyte interface. That's very important to stabilize the whole batteries. Um, so how do you avoid the breaking? And um, 2008 January, actually the paper coming out 2007, December, and Nature Nano, this is the paper, uh, really the first of uh, using uh, nano science to tackle the energy storage problem. And uh, my group published this paper. This turned out to be the milestone paper, the, this paper opening up the whole new field of uh, nanotechnology for energy storage. You see the citation. That's the reason it's cited so many times by now. So Candace was my first graduate student. Um, this is silicon nanowire glow on a metallic carbon collector stainless steel. And uh, electrons can move in and out because this nanowire has a uh, contact with this metallic carbon collector. The diameter of the wire can relax the strain. Lithium can come in from the side wall and during charging and discharging. And, and this uh, new concept breakthrough really uh, stimulate and the opening of the whole research field. So to understand what's happening, and my group has been trying to develop electron microscopy method to look at this process in uh, operando. So this is the TM holder from the, this is nano factory holder. Uh, we can mount silicon nanowire to the tip of this holder that's controlled with piezoelectrical uh, controller and insert into ionic liquid. And the other side is lithium cobalt oxide is the cathode. What we are having is a single nanowire batteries right there. We can apply voltage, apply current, dry electrons going in and lithium coming in, start to react with silicon. And under the electron beam, TM beam, we are watching silicon. What's happening? We try to avoid the damage, the, uh, the E-beam damage with ionic liquid because we don't look at ionic liquid. Um, so we can observe what's happening in the solid state silicon. And we can also put the particle onto silicon wire. This uh, lithium can diffuse and react with the silicon particle as well. So we, we can look at what's happening. So this is uh, a lot of mechanical analysis is in collaboration with my colleague, uh, Professor Bill Nix here at Stanford. And Matt was my early graduate student, now faculty member in Georgia Tech. So let me share with you the first video. This is 200 nanometer scale bar. 
um, and uh, we lithium, lithium uh, silicon, and lithium coming in, you can see the volume expansion takes place. This is already speed up by about 10x also. Um, and uh, these uh, silicon wires have a surface coating, the black color, they are copper. You see silicon volume expansion takes place. Uh, silicon by itself, it does not break, but what's broken is this copper coating. Um, the next video is a silicon nanoparticle. This is 800 nanometer in the center. Surrounding it are the smaller one, but this particle, you can see lithium coming in, there are volume expansion taking place, and the center right here, crystalline core is shrinking and react with lithium, create amorphous lithiated silicon shell. Um, during this process, this huge stress building up, the silicon get broken. Uh, and once the silicon particle is broken, uh, they lose electrical contact from each other and uh, the capacity starts to decay. They also create larger surface area uh, that react with organic electrolyte and create more ad solid electrolyte interfacial layer. And that's SEI. So the battery decays very fast. So with this technique of in-situ study, we can see identify critical breaking size roughly about 150 nanometer and below this size. Right, this is a diameter and um, it, it doesn't break that easily. About this size, it starts to break more um, and because it has more stress right there. The nanowire critical breaking size is about 300 nanometer around that range. E, um, there is a small problem that uh, I do not know. Suddenly, um, I see that my registration is not working. So the link may go away after 10 minutes. So I have given another link just okay. now. So I have uh, also asked for an upgrade, but uh, it is not seemingly working. So I don't know what is wrong. I had uh, paid for it, but somehow probably some registration issue. So, so then you, you sent me the email already, right? The link? Uh, in this chat box, there is this link. So. In the so chat, okay. Please just copy that link and then put it in case this uh, goes away. But otherwise, uh, it should work. Hopefully, it will, it will work. Otherwise, uh, we will use the new link. Okay. Yeah. So, um, should I just wait uh, or should I just go? You, do you guys want to all go to the new link right now? Um, maybe there's already a, a link there in the chat box. Just copy that and uh, put it in your, uh, uh, some Word file or somewhere. So, we can use that link later. Okay. Yeah, and continue. Hopefully this will continue. Yeah, I will copy the link and save here. Okay, I will continue. Yeah. All the participants kindly copy the link. Just in case it uh, stops working, we would move to that link for the rest of the lecture. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry about this. I don't know how this happened, but... Yeah, no, no worry. Uh, well, let's continue. So starting from silicon nanowire, over the past, uh, you know, close to 15 years now, we have been designing from generation one of wires, core shell nanowires, hollow structure, double wall hollow, and uh, try to solve problem at the materials level one by one. Now we have 12 generation. So let me highlight a few, you know, the importance of uh, electron microscopy can help us to the material design. One generation is this yolk shell structure with a silicon particle in the center right here. And then we have this uh, carbon shell with this hollow space right there. Once we put lithium in, the silicon take on lithium ions and, uh, and start to expand. But this carbon shell is really designed because that will fit this silicon. So we don't waste a lot of space, um, empty space inside this hollow carbon shell. With this carbon particles right there, building an interfacial layer, interface with electrolyte. Let me show you in situ uh, a TM video. Um, this is silicon particle right here. You see the volume expansion taking place and see the carbon shell. 
So we drive the lithium going in, so we, it fits in nicely. So this helps stabilize the structure. We also design a generation of silicon that have the silicon particles. Uh, each of these uh, orange dots are silicon nanoparticles. The aggregate forming secondary particles that help reduce the surface area if you do an outside coating. So, but the secondary particle, if you press on it, mechanical pressure press on it, you can break it. During the battery manufacturing, you need to press this whole electrode. You're going to press on these particles. Whether the particle can survive this mechanical pressure is important. So we design a new generation, these uh, shell coating onto the secondary particle, you know, or silicon forming the, is the coming from silane, coated become a solid shell, but still keep the empty space right there, allow silicon to volume expand. So this can take on mechanical pressure. For example, this is second silicon cluster consists of nanoparticle without any coating. This is in situ SEM indentation. You and then mechanically press onto the silicon. You see this uh, secondary particle fracture kind of you know break apart, right? But if you have the coating of silicon shell and uh, forming a solid shell right there, this can take on uh, a lot more mechanical. I have started. Uh, kindly mute all, please. Mute. Yeah, I got it. So how is it now? It's okay. We'll do it. I'm very sorry about this, but yeah. uh, let's go. Yeah, let's go. no worry. Um, so I was uh, showing you this uh, in situ nanomechanical indentation video uh, to help us design the materials, visualize that, to stabilize, to be stable under the mechanical pressure. Um, so with this, let me see. Yeah. And uh, silicon is this more than a decade of research in, in my lab and also later around the world and uh, has made into the commercial world. 2008, I found the Empress, the company to commercialize this technology. Now it generates these uh, highest energy density batteries in the world using uh, now uh, an Airbus uh, Cyphers S, this uh, commercial drone, flying the sky, breaking the world record. It, it moved into the uh, consumer electronics as well as the aviation and also electrical cars. Silicon now and now has been helping the whole battery industry uh, to increase the energy density so it's still very challenging, right, to uh, use in commercial space, the uh, company uh, learn how to do it, particularly Ampere's, the, uh, the startup company I founded uh, has been doing a great job on that. And next is uh, <coughs> lithium metal anode. Um, that's the holy grail of the batteries. And uh, charging and discharging lithium metal anode, however, is very challenging. It creates a lot of problems. It offers the highest capacity because it doesn't have a host. You play lithium and uh, it's very hard to maintain the flat surface. You cause the surface curvature change. That caused the breaking of the SCI and this crack formation. That's a hot spot. Growing up this dendritic structure easily, that can short your batteries and ca cause the battery catching fires and explosion. And if you strip lithium, away, there's no guarantee you strip from the top. You might strip in the middle, might strip in the bottom. And if you strip it in the middle or the bottom, you cause this dead lithium formation that disconnect um, from the underlying lithium foil, you lose this lithium fast, and this is called dead lithium formation, and your battery is a decay very fast. During this whole process, if you, you often need a capacity that's three million hour per centimeter square of capacity. And for your realistic uh, 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 batteries, that's 15 micron thick lithium. Every time you play 15 micron and then you strip it away. And the thickness, it changes too big. 
per layer of this lithium. Uh, if you have multi layers of lithiums right there, and this change adding together will be too big. Um, we recognized this problem in 2017. Uh, together with my student, we wrote this perspective article in Nature and Nanotechnology. We analyzed the past 50 years of research and we point out the two root causes right here, high chemical reactivity and uh, infinite uh, volume change in a relative sense. And the surrounding other problems we need to overcome. So the materials change is uh, gigantic, it's too much. Uh, basically, that's the reason. Um, in my lab, we have been working on this for uh, the past uh, roughly five years. Uh, coming up a lot of different strategies to address this problem. We, we are the first research group in 2016 in collaboration with Steve Chu to design a stable host, hosting metallic lithium into the structure. Metallic lithium in the past has always been, people use a foil, you plate it in, thickness increase, you, you strip it, thickness decreased. But we, we pointed out this uh, stable host needed. And it's also a stable interface to overcome the high chemical re reactivity issue of lithium metal. This all type of a stable interface we're trying to design in organic coating, uh, nano diamond, uh, boron nitride, graphene, and also the polymer. And particularly the polymer case is in collaboration with uh, Professor Zhenan Bao here in chemical engineering. Um, so let me share with you you know, the cryo-EM or the, sorry, the, uh, the TEM, particular environmental one, <coughs> uh, how to, to understand the chemical reactivity of metallic lithium, which the gas environment is important. Um, so this is a lithium metal. If you expose to air two hours, you see this clear change right there. And a lithium metal exposed to air under the electron beam, under the E-beam, right here. And you see this lithium dendrite formation is a dark color, but lithium metal is very light element. Uh, you shouldn't see such a dark color right there. So in order to study the activity, <coughs> reactivity of lithium metal with a gas environment, inside TEM, we use in situ that position inside TEM in a high vacuum condition to deposit this lithium and then exposed to air uh, to see what's happening. Now, this is a fresh lithium. Now you look at that, they're light contrast, light color right there. They're in a high vacuum condition. So we can understand its reaction with the gas molecule. For example, we expose this lithium metal to dry nitrogen, very dry, high purity of nitrogen. We can see there's a shear layer with time it grow and after about five minutes, we growing this uh, shear layer in uh, the order of about 20 nanometer also of lithium nitride if exposed to nitrogen. If exposed to oxygen, dry one, you are going to have similar phenomenon generating a lithium oxide, right? This is the process. It's actually a cell passivation process. The thickness increase with time, saturated after in you know, about five minutes or so. So it formed this very nice cell passivation layer. However, if we expose the nitrogen that has a little bit of water in there, very low amount of water, let's see what happened. You look at this in situ video and Titan, this is environmental TEM at Stanford right here. You see this uh, lithium metal get corroded away completely gone. So this uh, water coming in is a killer. You, it's not possible to form the cell passivation layer. So if you follow this process and look at this image, it's clearly you know, the thickness increase with time just linearly, there's no sign of saturation. It just keep reacting. The, compared to the dry case, dry case is only 20 nanometer. Now the wet cases go up to very thick of this uh, uh, react, reaction uh, product. So the reason is water and we have this lithium, generally lithium hydroxide and also hydrogen, this gas molecule generator. And this lithium nitride, even if formed, seeing water, it gets dissolved away. 
So it's not stable. So I want to also now bring your attention to the host material design I mentioned earlier. How do we overcome the volume expansion uh, of uh, lithium metal in the infinite, uh, the infinite volume expansion in the relative sense? And we need to design a whole structure. So in 2016, we published this, this Nature Energy paper and uh, we design a structure that's hollow carbon with particle of gold nanoparticles seeds in there. We know gold is expensive. This is for concept demonstration. We can use other low cost metal as well. And lithium light to alloy with gold and gold can function as nucleation seed. We can promote the nucleation inside this hollow carbon particle and contain metallic lithium right there, isolating lithium metal away from the organic electrolyte. Um, so we made this structure using a templated nanosynthesis, silicon oxide, put the gold particles and coat it with carbon, dissolve silicon oxide away. And these are the TM images of this hollow carbon shell, these gold nanoparticles in, inside the black dot. And uh, <clears throat> Now using a C2 TM electrochemical cell, we plate lithium into this uh, structure. Let's see what happened. Lithium coming in, this black dot is gold. Lithium error with gold. Lithium has the ability to dissolve gold away. This gold is a nucleation C. And, uh, and lithium plated inside this hollow carbon. And then once you strip lithium away, take out lithium now, uh, you will have gold particle coming back. They of course break into you know, pieces. Now you lithiate again, lithium coming in, dissolve gold away again. This just keeps going. This gold particle really have the nucleation of metallic lithium inside this hollow structure. And uh, this provide, this hollow can provide as, uh, uh, as a seed, uh, oh sorry, a host with those seeds in there, we can play lithium. They all go inside this hollow carbon. So this provides a lot more stability. This is the voltage of plating. And if you don't have these gold seeds in there, only hollow carbon, creation can happen outside of this hollow carbon. So you're going to grow up this filamental structure. That's a less stable uh, in the So during all this research, you know, we want to obtain uh, atomic scale resolution of uh, lithium metal, these uh, fragile materials or batteries. Uh, however, it's very challenging. This is a lithium metal dendrite and the regular TM room temperature. If you zoom in a little bit, you are going to just, the e beam really melt away and evaporate away this uh, metallic lithium, it's gone. There's no way you can get atomic scale resolution image. So we need a technique in, in doing that. Um, so in 2016, Wa Chu, you know, Wa just gave a seminar <laughs> here. Wa joining Stanford as faculty um, and uh, was about to join actually, I was, uh, I noticed this and uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't work on fire EM before, but through was uh, looking at was background, I pay attention to the status of the cryo EM. I was thinking, I said, wow, you know, cryo EM might be the method I can borrow from biology and use for my bathroom material study. And if you look at the history, of course, cryo EM was developed starting from in the material science community. And maybe the impact wasn't as big and then biologists uh, took it and uh, developed it further and uh, uh, leading to uh, amazing uh, you know, uh, you know, progress. So I talked to my two graduate students. So Yu Zhang already graduated now a uh, faculty member in UCLA. Yin Bing uh, remained in school as a postdoc. And of course, you know, the cryo EM won a Nobel Prize in 2017. 
And uh, very important development is how do you freeze your samples, the freezing protocol to preserve your uh, sample in the native state. How do you tune the imaging conditions and uh, with a low dose image without damaging the samples? And with uh, thousands of hundreds of thousands of images, the processing, right, is also important. We certainly learned something about that. But what's the new thing we developed right here? For the battery material, they are different from the biomaterial. We need to develop a freezing protocol that uh, make it workable for the battery materials. So for example, for lithium metal, we develop is a deposition of metallic lithium directly onto the TM grid, just using this grid as one of the electro assemble batteries and then de de deposit lithium metal onto the TM grid and open it up in the inner environment um, and uh, plant freeze into the liquid nitrogen. Um, and doing the develop a cryo transfer technique we can maintain the sample at the liquid nitrogen temperature and transfer into the TM chamber, right? Put onto holder. This is the liquid nitrogen cooled using the cold finger to cool the uh, uh, to uh, cool this uh, TM grid. Um, since this development was first time in the material battery field, actually, uh, these uh, down to this resolution, even in material science field, this this some study uh, on other material, particularly in the soft one, there's not a whole lot. The uh, the data we saw was so so exciting. It actually took a long time to for this manuscript to reveal nine months time. Uh, submitted 2016 December. Uh, 15, right? Uh, 2016, uh, Saturday in September next year. So it took uh, actually nine months time to reveal. This come out right before uh, the year accepted, right before the announcement of the 2017 uh, uh, Nobel Prize on the Cryo EM. And this is the lithium metal. Now we saw there are light contrast compared to room temperature TM, short time exposure already react with the air. Now lithium metal is a light element, right? It should look like this. And uh, we can stabilize that. We monitor the dose rate and the dose, you know, carefully one minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, turn out to be lithium metal is a lot more stable than organic uh, the biomolecules. Uh, we use EOS spectrum lithium K edge to confirm it's metallic lithium, it's not ionic lithium. What's exciting is we can observe high resolution TM image right here. This is atomic column of lithium for the first time ever. Imagine lithium ion batteries, lithium metal has been around 50 years. Nobody could resolve atomic scale resolution. This is first time we were able to. The reason is we can stabilize lithium metal it's chemically reactive. It's a melting point is so low, uh, only 190 degrees Celsius. The bonding is weak. The regular, the beam heating onto the lithium metal will melt it away if it's a regular TEM. Now under the quiet condition, it's stable. So then we ask the question, what's the damaging mechanism? Why cryo can help? Certainly there's a heating mechanism right there, right? In the cryo condition, this maintain this lithium metal in low temperature, stabilize that. There is a radiolysis mechanism as well. Uh, radiolysis also will, you know, this damage is reduced at low temperature. In the radiolysis, you freeze the atoms right there, they don't have mobility to move around. Uh, even there's any chemical bond kind of breaking a little bit, atoms maintain right there. Then what about the knock-on damage? Knock-on damage is something, you know, cryo, you cannot uh, prevent. You know, it just happened, right? It just directly knock on to these atoms. What well, turned out to be lithium is special. This is a simulation study by Yimei Zhu and his uh, co-workers from Wang and others. And really showing lithium metal is a kind of, uh, this light element is uh, special. If you look at graphite right here, you see the graphite, this is cross-section interaction versus the instant beam voltage. You know, the curve look like this. This easily made you to 
to say, well, if you look at graphite and graphene, you say, I want to use the low voltage to image. Interaction crossing is smaller, damage is smaller. But for lithium metal, if you look at it here, if you go to low voltage, damage is actually more. We are using 300 kV right there, actually damage is less. That's kind of interesting for this light element, this interaction. And even lithium and lithium graphite already follow the lithium metal curve, uh, uh, you know, qualitatively. The high voltage imaging is okay. So that's very interesting. So we have been using high voltage to image our lithium metal that reduce the knock-on damage. So with this understanding of lithium that's special, you see right here, uh, you know, very exciting problem is starting the solid electron interface. What's the atomic scale resolution? What's the structure right there? So the, in the past, there are two proposed models. This is the layer onto your anode, you know, tens of nanometers also. People say it's a mosaic model consists of different material patching together and, and mosaic effection. And this could be also a layer model proposed by another scientist that's Doron Alba, very, you know, very well-known battery scientist in the world. The other one, the first one was by Palais, also very well-known. This multi-layer model, then what's the real answer to that? You know, in the past, people use X using SPS. The beam spot size is so big, multiple micron easily, right? And the, using the depth profile to figure out what's the structure. It's very hard to build out the local structure. So using cryo-EM <clears throat> under the carbonate electrolyte, ethylene carbonate, diethylene carbonate, the regular battery electrolyte, we, on this stand drive, we were able to resolve atomic scale resolution the first time of the SCI solid electron interface. Seeing this inorganic particle embedded into these uh, more or less organic amorphous matrix, this sounds like a mosaic model maybe more accurate to describe that as a matrix. So we were able to see that, you know, this is the lattice plane right there. And as soon as we add an additive, this, adding this FEC fluorinated, containing fluorine in the electrolyte, my God, the whole structure change. This becomes the multi-layer with amorphous layer and this beautiful inorganic coating that's lithium oxide on the top. Bottom right here, because it's projection, right? This is metallic lithium with this mosaic pattern right there. On the top is inorganic particle also on the lithium metal. So you have some uh, mosaic pattern. <clears throat> so this SES structure completely changed. So later we call it like electrochemical performance with different structure of the solid electrolyte interface and see which one has a higher efficiency this multi-layer has high efficiency. <clears throat> so it's very, very exciting. Now this really allow us to reveal the mystery of uh, solid electron interface and the fractal battery materials. Now with the remaining few minutes, let me also share with you the cryo-EM opens up opportunity for many other energy materials and solving exciting energy science problem. One area is, is metal organic framework, right? This open framework structure consists of a metal center uh, right here and with this uh, organic linker coordinate using this oxygen often time and it's open polar structure. <clears throat> they have an important application, the morph, gas storage, separation, catalysis, energy storage, drug delivery, but to obtain the, uh, obtain the atomic scale resolution of this structure is very challenging. As soon as he been hitting onto this structure, they will not be stable. So for example, this is a morph particles. As soon as you're hitting onto e beam, for example, using electron diffraction pattern, we can see, you know, with very low dose, not that high. And this already become amorphous from electron diffraction pattern. So, and then you want to image host and gas chemistry. It's not possible. This interaction, right? You want to zoom in, look at atomic scale interaction and uh, they're not stable. Um, and how do we come up with a strategy stabilizer structure and also trap the host 
uh, the uh, gas molecules into the host. So we develop a protocol taking, for example, zip A is a morph materials, these particles, and we let the CO2, it's very useful for CO2, you know, separation, gas molecule absorb inside and pumps free it into liquid nitrogen. And now CO2 will trap in there doing the quiet transfer into the TEM using low dose detector without, you know, remove the gas molecules. And we can ho hopeful, we can image this host gas chemistry, you know, having the molecule trap in there. So this is collaboration with Ra and Bob Sinclair. These are our postdocs and graduate students. Now let's look at this morph particle. Now this is the first time we can obtain this stable image so beautifully of this particle, right? This is, if you zoom in right there, you see this is this open channel of this empty space polar structure. It is bright star uh, right there. It is a metal center coordinated with the oxygen. Um, now we can see this sharp edge. You know, it's really sharp edge, right? The sounds like it's the gross magnet is, is the step edge adding, keep adding this metal center and the organic linker forming the layer by layer growth. So imaging this allow us to actually figuring out the growth mechanism of the step edge addition mechanism growing layer by layer. During this process, we need to follow and really look at this diffraction and really check the, uh, the damage, the dosage test carefully. Now we follow the dose, for example, this is 25 electron per angstrom, 55 and 90. You follow this diffraction pattern, you pick this spot and 1.86 angstrom this spot right there and see its intensity change and monitor that, you know, with the beam uh, 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 you know, damage. And so for allow us to really check, make sure we didn't damage, uh, you know, these, uh, uh, these particles in a significant way. We need to pick our resolution of the imaging. So indeed this 1.86 angstrom we can easily achieve, right? Within about, you know, 20, 20 30 uh, electron per angstrom square. We, we follow that very carefully. Now we see all this understanding. Now we can image the top one is a high resolution image of uh, morph particles with this open channel, you see this center right here, this, this molecules coming in, but there's no CO2. Once you put in CO2, you see this bright spot in the center so beautifully. So compared to empty one, now this field one, you look at this field with CO2 trap in there. This is first time we can image this kind of host gas chemistry, right, CO2 molecule. They are not easy to be imaged. They are not stable. And now with liquid nitrogen cryo EM, we can see that really, really beautiful. Certainly down the road, we want to using our, use our operation cor corrected TEM, low dose image, the right electron detector K2 or K3 to have atomic scale resolve. Here we still couldn't resolve individual, you know, carbon oxygen atoms yet. Down the road, we hope we could do that. Uh, with a, um, you know, uh, operation corrected TM direct imaging. So far, the TM we use is the uh, TM using more in the biology, probably get to about two angstrom resolution also. We need a little bit better resolution to see individual atomic uh, atoms right there. We are on our way in, in doing that in collaboration with Ms. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Chu. So, let me mention, you know, over the past several years using cryo EM, you know, starting from the science paper we published in 2017, first cryo EM study on the battery materials. We studied many exciting problems on the battery field. We also studied the first, you know, having the first paper on the metal organic framework using cryo EM, exciting discovery right there. We also have the first paper on the hybrid perovskite as well in this Jewel paper on the first cryo EM. This is many, many first time actually demonstrated. I also mentioned these two other groups also working in cryo EM at, at a similar time, having pretty good data right there.
Um, we recently have this uh, uh, perspective review paper. I encourage everybody to read in uh, ACS Nano. We put in a lot of ideas of what quiet EM can do for material science, for energy, and really open up the very exciting opportunities. Uh, beautiful uh, paper it is. It's a beautiful paper. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so now let me summarize. Well, I was showing you the in situ and also quiet yen can help, you know, uh, reveal what's happening down to atomic scale and a very important material science, energy sciences problem and help us to provide a guiding principles to design the better material for those important applications. I would like to end my talk by thanking my collaborators over the years, Steve Chu, Bill Nix, Wa Chu, Bob Sinclair. We also now doing having a lot of collaboration with Jen Dayang and Paul McIntyre. And uh, the funding support from uh, Department of Energy, both on the battery program, as well as the uh, basic energy science, material science division. And my whole research group, I would like to thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions you have. I know it's getting late. Uh, and India, I appreciate you stay on to listen to my talk. Um, I'll stop right here. Well, what a beautiful talk. It is, um, although we had a small glitch, uh, the glitch is now removed and uh, we have, we have uh, time. Um, but then, of course, uh, it is late. You know, so you are you say the whole excitement is because of uh, the low dose imaging, low temperature. Uh, you are in a position uh, to see lithium for the first time. Now, obviously, chemistry that is evolving on lithium, that is time evolution of that, yeah. dynamics of that, the whole range of additional things that come about. So can you please throw some light on that? Yeah, I think the quiet one, because you freeze everything right there, then this dynamic picture sounds like you will be losing that. But what you gain is uh, atomic scale, you freeze that, you can look at it for a long time uh, to get that atomic scale resolution. But in order to build up a dynamic picture, Maybe what needs to be done is you freeze at different stage and you look at each stage uh, of their structure. Then you can build up some of the dynamic picture right there. That's, that's I think, the, uh, the technique we could use down the road to see some of the, those. But you are not be able to see it in real time. But whether we can have a cryo yen you know, maybe not so cold at liquid nitrogen temperature, a little bit going up at temperature, but still cool enough to stabilize uh, the structure, but still allow the dynamic process to happen. Maybe that could happen as well. We don't know. So we'll, we'll need to study that. <clears throat> you know, yesterday when what you was uh, uh, talking about a few days ago, not yesterday, um, really seeing water around proteins, uh, seeing hydrogen bond, probably likely to see hydrogen, count the number of water molecules. So which tells me that maybe in lithium, in this battery system, the interface, the excitement that happens at the interface, we may be able to capture that and gain more insights as to how would charging, discharging occur at the interface. You mean dynamically? Dynamically may not be, of course uh, not, but you are freezing in time. Yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think very likely that's possible. Yeah, very likely. So uh, <clears throat> um, we, will, we are working on that. I think the possibility is there, yeah. <clears throat> You talked about breakage, you know, expansion and subsequent breakage of the system. 
Yeah. So this is again another subject matter as to how phase transitions occur uh, in systems. Uh, are there are there additional insights that are coming? Yeah, I think that actually the phase transition imaging is probably easier compared to the interface with the organic environment. So some of the high resolution imaging obtained by other people, for example, in silicon, or not on silicon, on tin oxide in the past, some other groups uh, in the in situ one. And that transformation process uh, down to atomic scale resolution, the video has been obtained. I think there's a lot of insight right there. <clears throat> Let's you see this layer by layer kind of zipping transition, very exciting. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, Yuhan the other day was talking about uh, the excitements uh, in MOFs, uh, imaging MOFs and seeing uh, individual benzene rings. Uh, so all of these are under, you know, changing the way in which we are seeing matter. And that yeah. along with dynamics will probably change everything. Uh, <clears throat> and the fact that in your studies, all of these have led also to real products and, and things uh, that one can commercially mm -hmm. utilize. That's also amazing. Many a time, you know, what happens is only the scientific insights and it stops there. Yeah, I'm excited to see uh, this learning has, uh, and our learning leads leading to the uh, product. Absolutely, I'm excited about that. Yes, uh, you have some science, you have a question? Uh, can you- Yes, uh, 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 yes. hello, can you hear? Yes, we can hear you, go ahead. Hear me? Professor Pradeep? Yes, we can yeah. hear you, please So, uh, uh, Professor Kuhn, it's a wonderful lecture. It's a wonderful lecture, just I'm rather curious to know that uh, like in the battery, you have both the charging and also the discharge. So under the our redox bias, can we understand the processes at the low temperature under uh, the electron microscope? Yeah, I think I think uh, a little bit discussion with Pro, uh, Pradeep. Uh, uh, so is the this temperature with too low liquid nitrogen temperature, uh, we are not going to be able to drive lithium around moving. Maybe not so cold as uh, liquid nitrogen temperature, uh, li still cold, but higher than li liquid nitrogen temperature. Maybe possible, we don't know yet. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Are there other questions? <laughs> so, so this is Venkat, can I ask? Uh, Go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, Professor Q, it was a wonderful talk and uh, particularly very interesting to see the image of the SCA layer, which was uh, like for years, it was poorly understood. However, they, it is very important to understand the SCA layer. But if I uh, understood from your, if I understood correctly, there is a layer of lithium oxide is forming on surface of this lithium. Is that right? So on the SCI, you mean yeah. you mean SCI? Yes, there is a on one once we put in fluorinated uh, okay. carbonate electrolyte, we see a lithium oxide layer on the top. Yes. Yeah. What is the typical uh, this thickness of this layer generally? Is formed? Oh, it's only a couple of nanometers. Okay, okay. Because I was wondering, like uh, the lithium shuttles between the cathode and the anode. So if it forms uh, lithium oxide, that much of lithium is not now available to shuttle. Is that right? If I understand correct? Yeah, yeah. So that's why SCF formation, you consume some lithium. There's always the first cycle columbic efficiency loss, right? This contributes okay. to that part of that. Yeah. Okay. So uh, also one more question related to that, like you have shown the other like uh, lithium phosphate and lithium silicon uh, material. So uh, how would the SCI layer of those things look like compared to this uh, lithium alone? Yeah, um, so silicon's case, um, there's a lot of similarity to lithium metal, but there's also difference 
uh, silicon surface has intrinsic oxide already. Okay. Uh, you know, that can cause quite a bit of difference, right? There's the lithium coming in, react with silicon oxide forming lithium silicate. Then on top of that, you start to build SCI. So we have a detailed study actually to uh, a paper. If you check my group uh, recently, maybe about a year only. Sure. Uh, having a very detailed study on that. The whole dynamic process okay. is slightly different from on lithium metal. What's the composition right there? Okay. And uh, where the lithium oxide uh, coating on the top will show up or not, that there will be difference right there. So I encourage you to take a look at it. Maybe time is too short right here to go okay. through that study, yeah. Sure, thank you. It was a very wonderful talk and uh, really exciting actually. Thank you. Subo, you have a question. Um, yes, uh, thank you. Um, Professor Equi, uh, hi, extremely inspirational talk. I kind of lost my sleep. I don't think I'll be able to sleep tonight. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, thank you for the beautiful uh, 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 data and the images that you showed us. Uh, I have a question. So, um, uh, is uh, like, uh, now that uh, people have started looking at uh, solid state and gel state electrolytes uh, for solid state lithium ion batteries, uh, can you comment on how, uh, whether uh, cryo TEM or operando can be uh, used to visualize uh, lithium transport through amorphous electrolytes? Yeah, Here I it's... think, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's my question. Yeah. yeah. I think, yeah, the cryo EM and also in, in this in situ electrochemical cell will be very useful uh, to study in you know, on a solid state system. So far, the making the solid state, making the in situ cell, I think how do you prepare a sample? It's not easy, it's very challenging, actually very, very challenging. Mm -hmm. So my group uh, has been working on that as well. And then, pro uh, same thing, prepare the cryo EM sample is also challenging. Um, but if we could prepare that, imagine you now you have a lithium metal, a solid state, you can do in situ. You can see this interfacial reaction right there. Whether you can see lithium move, uh, movement or not, that's harder to tell. It's very hard to see lithium ion movement. But at least you can see the structure change, uh, the interface reaction accompanied with this whole process. I think it could be very valuable. And cryo EM case was certainly the same thing, right? You have a solid state and you have lithium metal and the solid state interface. And you want to study that with high resolution, you need cryo EM to stabilize that. Yeah. yeah I think yeah. it's a lot of value uh, for the solid state system as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions? Younger people, most uh, people are young, very young. So why don't you ask some questions? Hello. Yeah, go ahead, Subrita. Yeah. So, sir, uh, in a in a diagram, we have shown that there is lithium here or, here or lithium sulfur battery. For that case, we are getting more higher energy density compared to simple lithium ion battery. So what is the reason behind this? That I have some kind of query like, so is there any chemical reaction or any chemical species that is for me inside the reaction, reaction medium? So please make a comment on this. Talking about lithium and lithium sulfide. What did you say? Lithium air and lithium sulfur, which has high energy energy density compared to simple lithium ion battery as shown in the figure, maybe six or seven slide. So what is the, the reason behind this? I must see that one. Yeah. So the reason is the lithium sulfur energy density per way is much higher because if you look at sulfur, it takes on lithium become lithium sulfide. So one sulfur can store two lithium, like lithium 2S. So sulfur, this element is not heavy. That's why per unit weight, you can store a lot of energy. 
its energy density per weight is much higher than lithium ion. Lithium ion, if you look at lithium cobalt oxide, one cobalt atom, two oxygen, store one lithium. And that one lithium, you can only use half, usually a little bit more than half. So the ratio, atomic ratio, lithium to the host is one to six. But for the lithium sulfide is uh, two to one, right? Two lithium, one sulfur. That's the reason. Just as um, the way oh, okay, you, you have taken uh, a, a structural biology tool to material science, maybe a lot of biologists can probably get greater insights with materials. For example, DNA is, is conducting. Yeah. Maybe, is it not possible to look at ionic transport uh, in these biological structures? Uh, are there, I mean, uh, greater insights that are coming or likely to come if a material science tool is taken to biology, not only for structural understanding, but for understanding properties. You know, this is a kind of a thought that comes to me. Obviously, you must have thought about it before. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, this, the uh, DNA, whether it's conducting the conductivity, this question has been studied for maybe 20 years now, roughly, right? Maybe 20 years now. It's, it's an interesting question. Um, and uh, there's others, I think the material science too, absolutely. Thinking about applying to a biology, understand the property of the biological system is powerful. Yeah, and deep is what too right here. Some of the things we develop will be very helpful to what the biological problem what, uh, has been studying. Well, are there other questions? Uh, Dr. Javel, you have something there? Um, well, um, we can always uh, get back to uh, uh, Professor E. Uh, subsequently, and then um, in case you have questions, please do uh, contact uh, him through email. This, um, this video uh, will be up uh, on the internet after some days. Uh, Jay Chandran, you have a question? I see a question there. Uh, yeah, the Hello? question uh, was uh, whether lithium titanium oxide and uh, materials could be alternative for lithium metal. So LTL, right, lithium titanium oxide, um, it's not for high energy density batteries. Its potential is uh, high as an anode. So if you use that as an anode, you lose voltage. The energy density was, will be much lower. However, lithium titanium oxide give you the fast charging. So it has a great value in the fast charging and also very long cycle life. If people know how to make it low cost, the whole battery system using LTO, maybe with LFP, very low cost. Then for the grid scale, that could be considered for electrical grid storage for different application purpose. The answer is yes, it's interesting, uh, but it's not for high energy. Just make sure we understand that. Obviously, when matter is looked at with uh, newer and newer tools, greater insights will come in, uh, better uh, understanding and better products. And uh, of course, it changes the world. And, and, and this has uh, been amply demonstrated with uh, this exciting journey through lithium batteries in this particular case. Um, obviously, there are more insights uh, and they will change the way in which we look at uh, energy science uh, itself. But then, you know, molecular storage, you touched upon that and what new excitements are there in that and that leads to uh, artificial photosynthesis and things of this kind. They're all very many exciting problems. So thank you for this fantastic lecture. We are uh, trying to build a cryo-electron microscopy facility at IIT Madras uh, in the coming uh, year or so. Uh, just got the money yeah, just uh, a few days ago. Uh, so hopefully that will come up and uh, we, we hope to get your, uh, your advice and suggestions as we move along in that journey. Um, 
that's all that I have. All the very best to you and please discovering more and then probably please translating them uh, for the greater benefit of the world. Thank you, Pradeep. And uh, I'd like to thank you all. You, it's, it's getting late in, in your place. And uh, have a good evening and have a good night and uh, good sleep, okay? Yeah, happy thank holidays. You.